Vitamin D, what can't it do, right? Well, actually, what does it do? In this video, I'm gonna tell you exactly what you need to know about the sunshine vitamin. How's it going guys? My name is Richie Kerwin and I'm a nutritionist and nutrition researcher at Liverpool John Moores University and you're watching the My Protein YouTube channel. This is a channel that brings you need to know info on how to fuel your body and train to be your strongest self. Today we're going to talk all about a vitamin that I think most people should consider supplementing with, vitamin D. I'll tell you how we make it, why we don't make enough, what it does and how much you should consider taking. As always, I wanna point out that I'm not recommending any particular vitamin D supplements. What I am going to do is talk about how vitamin D works and what to look out for when looking for a supplement. Let's start with the basics. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, which means it dissolves and can be stored in fat. That makes it different from water soluble vitamins like B and C because they can't be stored in our bodies and any excess that we eat gets peed out. Fat soluble vitamins can be stored in our bodies. This is good because it means we can store any extra vitamin D we make or we get from the sun, but it does have one negative side effect. If we eat way more than we need, we can store so much that it can become toxic in the body and have some serious negative health effects. This is called hypervitaminosis D and you do not want it to happen to you. Just to give you all an easy reference value, the recommended daily intake for vitamin D3 in the UK is 10 micrograms. As there are some different forms of vitamin D, we also measure it using international units, which standardize the effects of the different forms of the vitamin. 10 micrograms of vitamin D is the same as 400 international units. Vitamin D is a very interesting vitamin because we can make it in our skin when we're exposed to sunlight, specifically ultraviolet B or UVB rays. In our body, we use cholesterol to form a substance called 7-dehydrocholesterol. When our skin is exposed to sunlight, the 7-dehydrocholesterol just under our skin gets converted to pre-vitamin D3, which then gets converted to cholecalciferol. This then gets converted to calcidiol in the liver, otherwise known as 25-OHD3, which is what we use to measure serum vitamin D levels. Finally, this gets converted to the active form calcitriol in the kidneys. Try dropping that into a dinner conversation sometime. You are guaranteed to never get invited back. The great thing about producing vitamin D in our skin is that our body has a feedback system in place that stops you producing too much vitamin D from sunlight. So there's no worries of producing too much from sun alone. The problem with producing vitamin D from sun is we just don't get enough of it. You see, someone could probably make enough vitamin D from sunshine if they get up to 30 minutes of sun exposure, twice a week, over their face, arms and legs, if they're very fair skinned, and if they're relatively young. Do you meet all those criteria? The problem is we all spend a lot of times indoors, or pretty much all of 2020. And when we do leave the house, we're usually fully clothed, at least I hope you are. We often travel around in cars, glass filters out UVB rays, so you're not producing any in the car. And if you live far from the equator, like in Ireland or the UK, we only get enough UVB rays to produce vitamin D in the summer. On top of that, if someone has a darker complexion, like someone of Sub-Saharan African or South Indian origin, the melanin in your skin makes producing vitamin D much harder compared to people with lighter skin, especially for those living far away from the equator. And if you're older, we know that older people aren't able to produce vitamin D from sunlight as well as younger people. So getting it from sunlight isn't easy. What about from food? Well, that's an even worse story. Unfortunately, there are very few good sources of vitamin D in our diet. It's found in meat, eggs, or dairy, but not in high amounts. To give you an idea of how much is in meat, depending on the cut and the animal's feed, Beef steak has around five micrograms of vitamin D per kilo, which means you'd need to eat two kilograms of steak just to get your daily amount of vitamin D. Dairy products often have less, and that's why they are often fortified with vitamin D to prevent deficiency. Egg yolks are a little better, but you'd still need around 250 grams of pure egg yolk just to meet your daily dose. Now, animal liver can be a good source of vitamin D, as can some oily fish and fish liver, but not many people are willing to eat fish liver to get enough vitamin D. As for non-animal sources, you can get mushrooms that are grown under special UV lamps that increases their vitamin D content, but that's about it. In fact, the form of vitamin D produced in mushrooms and used in some supplements is called ergocalciferol, or vitamin D2. And while it still is a form of vitamin D, it's not as efficiently converted to the active form as vitamin D3. And this is why vitamin D deficiency is so common. Insufficient vitamin D is considered to be serum levels below 50 nanomoles per liter. So if you have above that, you're considered to be vitamin D sufficient. The problem is more than 40% of Europeans have levels below that, and actually 13% have levels below 30 nanomoles per liter. Vitamin D deficiency is actually considered to be a global health problem. So we don't get enough, 
Why does that even matter? Well, like I said, vitamin D is a very special vitamin. And one of the reasons for that is something called the vitamin D receptor. The vitamin D receptor is a nuclear receptor, which means that vitamin D binds with it and then regulates the expression of specific genes. That's important because the vitamin D receptor is found in virtually every tissue in the body, which means that vitamin D has a big role to play in our health. One of vitamin D's most famous roles is in bone health. And this is because of its regulation of our blood calcium levels. Vitamin D helps to increase the absorption of calcium from our gut. When blood calcium levels drop, it helps to absorb more calcium from our kidneys before we pee it out and can even take calcium from our bones if we need it. This is because the level of calcium in our blood needs to be maintained at a specific level. And it's essential to many processes in our body, like nerve transmission and muscle contraction. Because of its role in calcium metabolism, vitamin D is essential for building a strong skeleton and lower vitamin D levels are associated with lower bone mineral density and a greater risk of fractures in both younger and older people. But vitamin D is so much more than bone health. It's so important that low levels of vitamin D are associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and other cardiometabolic conditions. This is because vitamin D has an important role to play in both insulin sensitivity, how we process glucose, and the health of our body's fat stores. On top of that, vitamin D has a massive role to play in our body's immune system, helping us to fight off disease. And low vitamin D levels are even associated with greater risk of autoimmune disease. You've all probably heard of vitamin D being really good for upper respiratory tract infections. This is true, as supplementing is associated with lower rates of infection. But many of these studies aren't based around COVID infection, just respiratory tract infections in general. Here's an important aspect of nutrition science. We can say very little for definite. When we talk about the effect of a specific nutrient on a specific disease, we can only talk about risk. So for example, we can't say that having sufficient vitamin D levels would prevent someone from getting a disease, but we can say that it reduces their chances of getting it. It reduces the potential risk, but it's not a guaranteed protection. That's something people get wrong with nutrition science all the time. Vitamin D also has a major role to play in muscle growth and higher levels of vitamin D are associated with higher levels of testosterone, greater muscle mass, strength, and physical function. Because of all this, higher levels of vitamin D are also associated with a lower risk of death as we age. So it sounds like vitamin D is pretty important, right? And seeing as we don't get much from our diet or sunlight, especially in Ireland and the UK, supplementing is probably a good idea. Here's the thing, a lot of vitamin D supplement trials don't show any benefits, and that's probably because they don't supplement enough to raise serum levels. Remember, vitamin D insufficiency is when serum levels are below 50 nanomoles per liter. So getting your levels above that is important. If your vitamin D levels are quite low, that might take some time. That's why many people like to get their vitamin D levels tested so they know what their current levels are, and then they can retest after a year to see if their supplementation has worked. That's also a really good way to make sure you don't get too much vitamin D, which can be really bad for your health. From a dosage perspective, the current UK recommendation of 400 international units is probably not going to increase your serum levels much at all. To be honest, most multivitamins contain this amount, and hoping that this will raise serum vitamin D levels is like hoping to put out a forest fire by peeing on it. You can try, but you won't get very far. That's why higher doses of vitamin D3 may be better, up as far as the upper recommended dosage of 4,000 international units. In fact, if you get a blood test and your serum vitamin D levels are very low, your doctor may even prescribe you an even higher dose vitamin D supplement until your serum levels increase. Like I said, the best way to know your vitamin D level is to get tested. In the meantime, supplementing with a daily dose, as much as the upper UK limit of 4,000 international units of D3, may be enough to help prevent insufficiency. So what do you think? Did that clear things up for you about vitamin D? As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and remember to like and subscribe to the MyProtein YouTube channel for more great evidence-based information.